Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and today I want to talk to you about some of the land race breeding projects that I'm going to be working on in my homestead and some of the ones that I've already been working on here in Utah. So I figured that if you guys could kind of see what some of the projects are that I'm working on and the reasons why, then it might inspire you to get started on your own land race project in your own garden. So let's dig in and talk about some of these. Now the first one that I've chosen here is leeks and if you are part of the Facebook group this is not going to be a surprise because I've shared quite a few pictures of the leeks, them going to flower, the seeds starting, like all of that stuff because um, it's something that I'm pretty passionate about. So the goal for the leak project is to have um, an overwinter harvest without frost protection. That's ultimately what I want. So I want to have leaks where I can go out in the winter they're not under you know a hoop house or you know frost fleece or anything like that I can just go out I can you know clear off a bit of snow and I can pull the leaks out of the ground that's what I'm wanting granted the ground might be frozen so that's going to need some sort of insulation to be able to to do that but one of the tricks is to partially lift the leaks in fall so just kind of lift them up a bit and then it's easier to pull them out later on in the season when uh, the frost and the snow are here. But that's really what my, my goal is. And the reason for that is, you know, really to reduce the need for using frost protection. I want those hardy plants that are able to cope with the change in the seasons, that are able to cope with that cold, and I can, you know, keep harvesting them, you know, during winter, right? It's food to harvest in winter. It helps bridge that, you know, it's known as the hungry gap, right? The time from your last harvest in fall through to the first harvest in spring and that can be very long depending on where you are so I really want to be able to to do something like that with leeks and I mean we really love eating leeks here and one of the things that I really love is you can have way more plants in a space in comparison to onions Although I recently saw on um, a YouTube channel um, that I was watching of, oh my gosh, there was a guy in the UK and he has like an off-grid um, homestead. I don't really know where it is. Like I knew that he was from London, um, but him and his girlfriend have this, you know, 18 acres, I think it is. And, um, you know, they're kind of moving towards being, you know, off grid and self-sufficient and stuff. But they had um, this really unique way of growing onions where it was like a cluster sowing of onions. Um, and it was a, a Charles Dowding method. And Charles Dowding did a lot of, of, um, he's kind of very well renowned for the no dig um, gardening movement and um, it's it's a method of growing onions that I had not seen before so that's something that I'm definitely going to be looking into later on but for now I can fit way more leeks in a space than I can for onions and you know leeks are kind of known as being a little bit finickety and you know they can be difficult and things but you know leeks have been a pretty solid producer for us on our homestead and having fresh leeks in you know various recipes that we're cooking with is one of the things that we thoroughly enjoy and I've grown lots of different varieties of leeks I've grown ones that are really tall ones that are short and stumpy like all of that that. Um, and you know those kind of traits are things that I will look at much later down the line right now what I'm focusing on for my land race project is I want things that are going to survive through the winter so everything that survives through the winter I'm then I'm keeping them in the ground I'm not harvesting them I'm keeping them there in the ground so they will then produce seed I'm letting that pollination happen and then I'm saving that seed to then grow again the next year so the seeds that I've saved here from Utah they are then going to be placed into the garden that we're going to be having in Maine so we're going to see what is going to be surviving out of that. Now, one of the challenges that I'm going to be facing is, um, you know, there's obviously going to be quite a high die off rate. So I planted two boxes um, here in Utah of different uh, plants and, you know, not all of the plants made it through winter and that's totally fine. Um, so I'm not sure 
on the seeds that I'm saving, you know, this this year that I'm then going to be growing um, out in Maine, I have no idea what is going to be making it through the winter, if anything at all, when I grow it next year. So um, I'm going to be having to sow quite a lot of the seeds um, to see if anything is going to be surviving, because that's where you hedge your bets, right? You, you plant a lot more of the seed out and hopefully one or two of those plants are going to make it so you can then save the seed from that it survived and then keep keep that cycle growing and then once i've got solid you know plants that are going to make it through winter then i'll start to hone in on okay what are some of the other traits that i want do i want them to be you know short and fat do i want them to be long and skinny like what are some of the things that i'm wanting to then you know be able to use the plant better in the kitchen so that's my first project uh, the next one is squashes um, and this is uh, another multi-phase project just like the leeks is kind of you know multiple stages right um, so the squashes are going to be in multiple goals so the first goal is ripens in a short season no surprise there the second goal is going to be high yield yielding so we want plants that are going to produce um, a number of plants or a number sorry not a number of plants we want plants that are producing a number of fruits per plant or that are going to be producing larger fruits so on one hand if you've got a plant that's producing multiple smaller fruits they're going to be easier to use for you in the kitchen right rather than having to wheelbarrow in a you know 100 pound beast of a squash right that's going to be a lot more difficult for you to tackle in the kitchen when you've got to figure out bringing in you know a chopping mall to be able to split it or you've got to take it out to the log splitter to be able to get into the squash cake okay? that's not necessarily going to work so you know high y yielding is kind of a you know that's the second goal because it's a little bit nebulous right now because i don't know until we get to you know our homestead in Maine whether this is going to be something where I want lots of smaller squashes like personal sized squashes because we're going to be eating them more that way or whether I want something that's going to be much bigger that we can kind of hack at periodically and you know let's say that we've got a I don't know a 60 pound squash right that we we haul in whether we as a family are going to be able to stomach eating squash for like three weeks without getting bored um i can tell you just with knowing how my family is and what we've kind of done here in utah having smaller personal sized squashes is much better for us as a family like growing the big squashes is really great for you know we have a pumpkin growing competition between us right and then we always carve those pumpkins for halloween um but you know that's that's kind of a, a separate thing for us kind of managing you know the day-to-day -day and eating from the land having something that produces many smaller fruits is a lot more advantageous for us goal number three is that it tastes great and that's again kind of nebulous because it's depending on what we're going to be using the squash for right there's different types of squash there's the peppos which are your acorn squashes um your spaghetti squashes those kind of things as well as your summer squashes and some of the field pumpkins so um you know the big like pumpkin varieties that you can get um those are often the pepper varieties there's the maxima varieties and they store a little bit longer than the pepo varieties and um, sometimes those are like um, your Cinderella type pumpkins um, or they are things like your butternut uh, not butternut your buttercup type squashes right the the texture of the flesh is a little different it you know it's often not as stringy it's a little bit more drier um, and kind of more crumbly and then you have your moschatas which are like your butternut type um of squashes <laughs> um you know or like your seminal pumpkins those kind of varieties so there's differences there and you use them slightly different in the kitchen right so so depending on the varieties of of squashes that i've got going in this um, land race breeding project and there's going to be one for each different type of squash for sure 
Um, but maybe I'm looking at, you know, sweetness for pies. So the pepo varieties, those are things like your delicata squashes, right? I want those to be really sweet to have then, you know, make pies for the holidays and stuff. Um, or, you know, maybe I want ones that are better for roasting and taking on those, um, you know, more... Um, savory flavors right for the maximas and the butternuts right and i know for some people you know they want a squash that has like a longer neck so you know varieties like the pennsylvania crook neck um you know those offer some some really good uses in the kitchen because they're much easier to use because you're not having to deal so much with you know a seed cavity and then try and peel around that and you've only got like a little you know like one inch layer of you know, a less, you know, of um, squash that you're trying to deal with. Whereas if you've got a long neck, you've got a big chunky amount of squash, you can have it nice and chunky and, you know, you get a bit more, um, you know, for, for your the plant there. Um, so it really depends on how you're using them in the kitchen. So for me, for, you know, if I'm growing kind of a, a butternut type, um, you know, muschata type of um, plant, then yeah, I can definitely see having something with a longer neck is going to be um, way more useful for me in the kitchen versus something that is you know, smaller and rounder. Um, so it, it really depends, right? And your, you know, likings for a squash are going to be way different from mine. But that's part of the excitement of being able to develop like these land race projects because you're, you know, helping them to, the, the plant, you're helping them to figure out like these are the traits to continue propagating because these are the seeds that you keep saving. So one of the things that um, we have been doing is I've been growing different types of, this year I did different um, muschata varieties of squashes and I've just kind of let them all pollinate together. So I had um, a couple of um, Italian varieties, although their, their names um, are escaping me right now. Um, and uh, I had a land race variety that was grown here in Utah and it was grown in Utah in a short season so I had that earliness that came there but the squash itself was kind of stumpy it was almost it was like bell shaped so there really wasn't like a lot of, of neck to the squash to be able to use it was all seed cavity but it ripened really early and because it is crossed with some of these other varieties, those seeds that I'm gonna grow out next year, I'm hoping for earliness, we're gonna have early fruiting, but I'm also hoping that we're gonna have some exciting crosses there, some things that have got like a much longer neck, like the variety that I grew uh, it with, or also like a just a larger size to be able to um, help build in some of those traits. So that's, that's that. And the reason why is, you know, that we're growing those is squashes are really packed with nutrients, right? They have got a lot of stuff going for them. They're very versatile in the kitchen, right? You can use them in something that's sweet, like the pie pumpkins, or you can use them, you know, in savory dishes, like butternut soup is amazing. Butternut and sweet potato soup, really good, right? One of the favorites, like definitely, you know, a really nice, you know, staple for the winter. And, you know, one of our favorite recipes um, that we got from Oh, Hugh Fenley Whittingstall and River Cottage when we were watching it. Yes, I make my husband watch these things and that may have been how I managed to inspire him to get on board with this kind of lifestyle. Um, but they did this beautiful recipe where they had like these creamy leeks um, that were cooked in a whole little squash. So it was like a personal size squash and it almost had like this kind of creamy leek soup that was in it. But then, you know, you scooped out the the pumpkin or the squash you know as you were eating it and we really enjoy doing that um chris my husband he does uh what's called a pig in a pumpkin and it's like a pork roast that he does in a pumpkin uh with um cider like hard cider um and um that's also really good um i don't eat meat very often uh if at all these days um but that that is one of the recipes that you know we really enjoy as a family and it's a great way for us to get you know veggies into our diet as well um you know vegetable curry i always have some sort of squash in there because it helps bulk things out so the squashes are incredibly versatile 
uh, in the kitchen. And that leads me on to the fourth goal for the squash project, which is long storage. So your pepo squashes, um, they are the shortest like to survive through um storage they go bad pretty quickly so you know those are the ones that you need to use up first and then your maximas um they start to go bad so if your pepos are usually good between one to three months kind of depending on the variety obviously your acorn squashes and spaghetti squashes last much longer than you know thing something like zucchini but then your maximas tend to be you know lasting you know maybe three to i don't know six months at the most right um so they they last a little bit longer but your longest lasting squashes are your moschatas which can last you know six months plus um so it really depends you know of course you've got to make sure that you cure the pumpkins and things to start with but as a homesteader that is going to be living off the you know the plants that you're growing on there squashes is a complete no-brainer in terms of a resource for food because you don't need to be you know bothering to you know can it or freeze it or anything like that because if you've got the right varieties and you're going to use these up in recipes as you're going through then you know you've got like food to to keep going for quite a while of course you don't want to be growing so much that that's all that you're going to be eating because you're going to get sick of squash pretty quick but getting creative in the kitchen can help you keep it going a little bit longer um in there so that's why squashes are high on our priority list um for our land race project and then next sorry i've got all my notes in front of me in, in my notebook here uh so the next one is melons um and our goal for melons is to have a northern climate uh sweet and flavorful melon without the need for a greenhouse so um why why do we want melons well um we have had this year a number of different varieties of fresh melon and fresh melon out the garden that you know you've put in the, in the refrigerator to chill on a hot summer's day is delightful like we've had melons that have been so fragrant like you open up the fridge and all you can smell is this beautiful melon smell um it's it, it always makes me laugh because i knew that the melons were coming up ripe because um sparky my border collie um he's he's 16 bless him and um he would like make a beeline to the melon patch he loves melon absolutely loves to eat melon and um he would be going over there and he's like looking at the melons and looking at me and then looking at the melons like well if you don't pick it i'm gonna <laughs> so um you know he he really loves loves the melons and of course they look like a, you know a giant ball for him so you know entertainment on multiple levels there for him um but you know, he would always come out in the garden and, you know, I got to, I got to watch this dog because he's sneaky. Like, um, if I don't keep my eye on him, I'll find him in the carrot patch and he's pulling up the carrots and eating those. Um, so, you know, I, I, maybe, maybe it wasn't that I couldn't grow carrots. Maybe it was just that Sparky kept eating them. <laughs> hey, didn't you? You poor old doggy. You daft dog um he's by my feet well while i'm recording this but melons are you know definitely a seasonal treat that we love and um you know having the experience of growing my own and i think the only way that i can really explain it is that my outlook on melons has been completely transformed like melons were a fruit that was like eh, i can give it or take it because they're just so insipid from the grocery store they're just you know it's just slightly sweet water maybe um you know not a lot going for it but growing your own and seeing like the complexity of the flavors and how they differ so we actually had a number of different varieties um, of melons growing some of them were uh, Aussie variety an open source seed initiative variety um, some were you know like different heirlooms I cannot remember the the variety of heirlooms that um, I had but I had multiple of them I want to say one was like uh, Delis de la table uh, not that my French is any good um, and then another one might have been Hallie's best or Hale's best I think it's Hallie um, I I'll be honest I grew it because I thought of Edmund Hallie and you know the 
the, the the whole science thing like that might have been a big driver for me planting that one um and then i had i think a variety that my friend um down in alabama had sent me and i just kind of like sewn them all together and then let them all kind of kind of grow but we we kind of placed them all you know like harvested them and then had like a slice of each of them and then my husband and I were kind of you know doing a taste comparison between them and you know that the textures were very different there was some that were you know almost I mean they were like butter they were so soft and they just kind of melted in the mouth um through to ones that were you know a lot more crisper they were ripe they were incredibly ripe but they they had a lot more you know of a crispness to them um almost kind of like watermelon i guess and then um you know the flavor profile was very different so you had some that were kind of you know um like bright and kind of citrusy almost in flavor to some that had like this kind of earthy sort of spiciness to them um which was really interesting um that you know that there was just such a drastic flavor profile from them so what what we did was we've we've got seeds from um all of them and i kind of wrote down um on the bit of uh, kitchen paper like some of the flavor profiles on them so i wouldn't forget um but basically you know all we did was we took the seeds out of these melons and then spread them on paper towels and then let them dry um that that's seed saving super easy right melons dead easy to do um and you know what the the plan is is we want to plant out a bunch of of these um melons and see if we can get some that are going to ripen within a short season now i could grow them in um the greenhouse but i am actually going to be needing the greenhouse for other things like hot peppers and stuff like that um, so I want to make sure that the, the greenhouse space that I have is going to be used more efficiently. So I would much prefer to have melons growing, you know, outside of the greenhouse if possible. Um, so that's something that we're going to be working towards with our land race. Um, and, you know, if we can get it so we can grow them in, you know, a short space without the need of the greenhouse, that's going to be fantastic right having fresh melon growing pretty far north and you know there's varieties that are already ripening within a northern climate we've just got to make sure to try and work in some of those um genetics so that's part of the exciting piece of this sort of land race project is you know now i'm going to be looking for those short season melon varieties i'm going to be pairing them with some things that I've already grown and they ripened incredibly quickly um, where I am. So they were pretty, pretty early to ripen, but then sort of start sort of training it into having, you know, the flavors that we really liked. And what I discovered was my husband and I actually have very different um, likes in terms of, you know, a melon flavor. So we're almost going to have like a his and hers melon strain, which is going to be kind of fun uh, later on. All right, the next one is eggplant or aubergine, as uh, we we Brits call it. So the goal is to have high productivity in a short season. So eggplant is quite a long season um, vegetable to grow. It is one of those things that you um, are typically starting indoors, like up to 12 weeks um, before your uh, last frost date in spring. So I grew a number of different varieties. I've grown like the... Uh, black beauty eggplants which is the large kind of black variety ones that you typically see at a grocery store i've grown uh, the long kind of skinny um asian varieties uh which which were good um i expected them to be a little bit bigger like fatter than what they what they were but mine grew like pretty pretty small and and skinny um they almost looked like purple snakes growing on the plant um and then i've also grown um a spanish variety which were these kind of white um eggplants with this beautiful purple streaking on them um they they were truly truly pretty um and they were really, really delicious. And the reason why I want to spend time on doing an eggplant land race is because I love eggplants. Um, and I use them in so many different dishes in the kitchen. And one of my favorite recipes is, uh, we call it Norma Nuda. And it is um, like grilled eggplant and that you grill on the barbecue. And then you, you slice, slice them up. 
um, and then toss them through um, pasta with a freshly made from scratch tomato sauce. And it is one of my favorite things because you get this beautiful smokiness from, you know, the barbecued um, eggplant that's in there that pairs just really nicely with a homemade pasta sauce. And it's just, I mean, it's one of my favorite things. Like, you know, my husband doesn't need to take me out for a fancy like date night or anything like if I can just come home from work and you know that's at the the dinner table with you know a a very large glass of red wine like sold sold like you know he gets all the husbanding points um you know so babe if you're listening uh had you know hint hint um you know, but, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy eggplants and there's there's a lot of different ways um, to use them. And uh, I was always kind of nervous of, of eggplants because, you know, you're just kind of used to the ones um, that you get in the grocery store, which can be pretty bitter. But actually growing my own, um, I've seen that there's not been that bitterness in different varieties. So that's that's exciting. Um, I have noticed that there's differences in the plants themselves and how they grow. So the Spanish variety that I grew was pretty spiny and I went to harvest... Um, the the plant and I thought something had bitten me um like there was a bug or something that had bitten me but um because um my fingers were all bleeding and I I never realized that there was spines on them so you know if I was developing like th- this particular land race then I might focus after you know looking for something that's got high productivity in a short season maybe I want to breed out the the spininess so you know when i'm harvesting it i'm gonna have an easier time so um there's there's some some things that we can definitely look at um, moving forward with that project so you know one of the ways that i've started doing this um eggplant breeding project here in utah is to be growing multiple varieties together trialing them out seeing what grows you know what's grown well for me what hasn't um the black beauty eggplants for example have never grown very well um for me in utah they've been uh, small or they've not ripened the spanish variety i've had multiple harvests from and um, the asian variety as well i've had multiple harvests from although the fruits have been a little on the small side so i can start to look at well i can keep that smaller size it's not necessarily great for doing um you know eggplant palm or anything like that in the kitchen but maybe um you know, this is going to be a trait that's going to marry much better to being in a shorter season, right? And the same could be said for, you know, peppers or anything like that, where you're trying to get things to grow in a shorter amount of time, you might do better sacrificing having larger fruits for having multiple smaller fruits to be able to get the same, like, weight in harvesting, so just something for you guys to think of and my final vegetable that i'm going to be working on for a land race project is actually kale and i know kale you either love it or you hate it much like a uh, favorite uk um you know sandwich spread although i guess well i just have it on toast when i can get it uh we all know uh what we're talking about it's a brown jar with a little yellow label on it um i love the stuff um i i'm really weird i really like um that in with bananas in a sandwich i know that's just really weird my mum made it when i was a kid and uh somehow i've never quite kicked the habit for that but kale is um a really really great vegetable it is packed full of different nutrients um it is very very good for you it's loaded with lots of different vitamins and minerals that your body needs um and one of the things that you know i really like is the the goal of having year-round kale growing without frost protection so just like i was talking about the leeks having plants that will grow without the need of frost protection that i can keep harvesting is is kind of um pretty alluring for uh, me as a homesteader now kale cabbages those kind of things are going to freeze 
pretty pretty solidly I would think in Maine um, so I'm going to see what I can get in terms of winter hardiness by growing different varieties and seeing what is gonna you know tolerate through winter much better some of the Russian varieties of kale um, tolerate the colder conditions far better so in my garden I've grown multiple varieties of of kale over the years here in Utah and the ones that have you know um, consistently made it through winter without any frost protection whatsoever um, that have thrived the next spring and then just put on a, a boatload of flowers that have brought every single pollinator within like you know a five mile radius to my garden um, have been the the ragged jack or the the red russian varieties and they go this beautiful you know burgundy red color when the weather gets cold um but having you know different types of kale that are more adapted to the cold is quite an exciting prospect for me um one of my favorite kale to grow is one of those early vegetables that i grew in my parents backyard and that was a jersey walking stick kale so that's always got quite a uh you know a, a special place in my heart as well as the scotch curly kales um i i love to grow those my dogs love eating kale they absolutely adore eating it and i always know when it's like a, the perfect sweetness because you know i'll turn around and i will find you know all four of them nibbling on the kale uh, <laughs> which you know again i'm pretty sure sparky's the ringleader of that one like hey this is great y'all should uh, get in on this um so, you know, having, um, you know, the, the dogs isn't necessarily a good thing in the garden. Um, but it, it does offer a lot of possibilities for having food that's available throughout that hungry gap. So remember, that's the time from your last harvest in fall through to the first harvest in spring. And, you know, that's often like the longest time for people. And that's when, you know, you as a homesteader, you're, you know, really starting to, you know, use up the, the preserves that you have, things that you've canned, things that you've frozen, things that you've dehydrated um, to really stretch through um, that hunger gap right and having plants that are still going to be not growing um, necessarily because not a lot's going to grow in winter but it is going to be harvestable um, during that season without you know too much you know damage like I don't necessarily want like cabbage that has like a whole head that is frozen solid when I go to harvest it right I want it to you know maybe like the outer leaves are frozen but the things inside are you know still still edible right that might be a possibility I don't know but in terms of, of the kale I'm really wanting something that's going to you know tolerate that cold weather it'll be great if I could do it without frost protection um but in the back of my mind like logistically i know that it's probably more likely to be needing um a frost protection cover than what something like the leeks are because the leeks you're not eating those top greens you're eating the parts lower down that are usually in the soil where you've got some some level of of protection so um that's that's kind of what i'm looking for and i'm not necessarily like choosing you know that i want the tall walking stick kale varieties yet um or i'm wanting the super frilly like scotch curly kale varieties or anything like that yet i'm more looking for you know the varieties that are going to be thriving the best in the climate so you know moving to somewhere like maine i'm not entirely sure what the pest pressure and things are going to be like in this garden so you know the kale project's going to be one that is is quite quite exciting because i've got to see what's going to grow well what's going to tolerate you know the pest pressure a little bit different but also adding into this i have um an interesting um project that i'm i'm part of where um we're trying to do a perennial kale breeding project and that is really exciting so growing up in in the uk one of the things that was quite fun to forage for is sea kale which is a a perennial um member of the brassica family obviously grows by the sea and um it grows year round 
So some wonderful gardeners have been working very diligently to have a perennial uh, kale project. It's got lots of different genetics and things in there. And that's something that I think would be incredibly exciting. And that's kind of what started this year round kale growing as being part of, of the land race activity. So um, I've got a going to be having like a perennial kale project that's going off separately that I can then contribute um, the seed back to as part of this ongoing breeding project uh, which is going to be really cool if I can get it to work in Maine um, if not then at least I can give some feedback on you know it growing in a colder climate but if I start to see traits of this land race where we've got potential for this year round thing happening and I've got something from the perennial side that's happening then I might see about portioning off some of those seeds to start developing a more perennial activity so there's a lot of things that are going to be kind of cool and exciting happening on the homestead but that's just five of some of the bigger land race projects that we're working on there's lots of others too from growing grain and upland rice um, through to you know um, maintaining and growing different uh, lettuce varieties so I would really like to know from you what's going to be your land race project what varieties or what um, vegetables are you going to start with so let me know in the facebook group i would love to hear from you until next time i hope your garden grows beautifully and i will see you all next week